my name's Kia Roach Turner, and uh, I'm about to be a feature film director um, in the Sydney, Australia region. So I've done a whole bunch of short films, music videos, all that stuff. Been working in the industry for a while, but I'm only just about to release my first feature film called Wormwood. So in a couple of months, I can actually say that I'm a feature film director. So that would be good because I've been working towards that for a while. Wormwood is something that I'm directing um, and producing with my brother. So we're going to be we're, we're going to be like the new Spearig brothers. Um, we we as a team have been making films since we were like little kids. You know, we started off on little shitty high eight cameras, and we've moved our way all the way up to the sort of more later stuff. Um, basically, we were always going to make a feature film. So me and him together were always working towards that. And a couple of years ago, oh God, three and a half years ago now, wow, we came up with the idea to take Dawn of the Dead, which was a huge sort of favourite of ours, me and my brothers, and Mad Max, which uh, I was obsessed with as a kid. Um, and meld them together to make what is going to be Wormwood. So it's a post-apocalyptic zombie sci-fi fantasy action film. So there's a lot of genres melded in there. We were going to make a feature film. We made a little short film with like, um, it's like a sort of Afghanistani, Afghanistani soldiers like ages ago. So the first idea was, you know what, that was really easy. We get the uniforms, we'll go out to Broken Hill and we're going to make a monster fantasy set like out in Broken Hill, but it's actually going to be set in Afghanistan. So we're going to do like Australian soldiers in Afghanistan. We're going to do it like Full Metal Jacket. So the first half of the film would be the training, like and go specific into the training. Second half of the film is going to be they go over to Afghanistan, um, go into these caves looking for the Taliban, and there's a bombing raid that happens overhead and it, uh, seals them into the cave and opens up a crack and they discover these uh, monsters that have been underground in Afghanistan called the Jinn and um, they were going to have to fight them. It was going to be basically like The Descent, but then The Descent came out. We're like, well, we're fucked, you know, so we can't make that, so what are we going to do? The next thing we sat down, we go, okay, we have no money. We probably won't get funding. Um, we have a bunch of friends. That's all we got, and we got a camera because the 5D just came out, which was the catalyst for making the film. When that, when that camera came out, and I realised that we could do stuff cheaply in a very inexpensive camera that for all practical intents and purposes looks like 35mm film. It's like bang, that's it, we've got the camera, we can make the film. What's the concept going to be? Zombies came up very quickly because you look at something like Dawn of the Dead or you know, um, Return of the Living Dead, not Return of the Living Dead, what's the, what's the original one? Um, Night of the Living Dead. You look at that and you go, okay, what's that guy got? He's, he's got a camera and he's got a bunch of people covered in blood. I can do that, you know, because I've got a lot of friends who don't mind getting dirty. They can build shit, you know, you've got to learn, you've got to, you, you use what you've got. And I, I think that's something Robert Rodriguez said in his um, book, what was it, Rebel Without a Crew? He's like, you look at what you've got and you use that. You know, he had a bunch of Mexican friends, he had a small town in Mexico and I think a drug dealer owned the town so he could blow shit up in that town. And he goes, well, I'm going to make El Mariachi because I've got all those elements. We had, like I said, friends, uh, a lot of our friends are builders, all that kind of stuff. So we decided, let's do zombies. Um, but you have to have a hook. You know, you can't just do, you know, like um, uh, they already did Dawn of the Dead and they already did, you know, uh, that kind of stuff. It's all, it's all been done before, you know. Um, so we, my brother actually came up with the weirdest hook. Um, we sort of settled on the Mad Max look because we were, we were like, look, we love the Mad Max film and post-apocalyptic stuff. And um, we've been waiting for somebody to do it again, you know, basically since we were kids. And nobody's done it. So we're like, you know, we're going to fucking do it. So we're going to take Mad Max. We're going we're gonna to put zombies in it. Um, but we still didn't really have that magical hook. And then one day, my brother, who's like, he's the producer, but he's got a very creative kind of left of centre thinking brain. Um, and he just goes, well, what if we... What if the zombies breathed a methane gas that we could then utilise to like run the Mad Max like vehicles? And I was just like, that's the hook. And then we're off and running. So, you know, we started, we started with a seven minute short. So we knew we were going to have two blokes in a post-apocalyptic wasteland dressed kind of like Mad Max. And you're not, we knew we'd get away with it. It's not fucking copying because they're, they're dressed in armour because they're fighting zombies and they don't want to get bitten. So you get away with that aspect because it's not so much stealing an idea as a, it's a standard idea that you would put armour on if you were going to be fighting monsters that if they bite you, 
you're a fucking zombie, you know. So you know you need to have all your you know you need to have all your parts covered up. So it made sense to have the armor. So we figured we'd kind of get away with that too. Now the first thing we did was purchase a four wheel drive, like an old Toyota Hilux from 1981, I think. It was like four grand or something. Like that was I think that was half the entire budget of the the, the original short that we did. And we just put spikes all over it and we put our big methane canister on the side. Like he and his mates just sort of built that. Um, that took ages. We built that out the front of the house actually over a period of weeks. And it was, it was pretty weird seeing the, the neighbours kind of walk back and forth watching us build this. It just looks like, it looked like a rape vehicle or something, you know what I mean? Like it's just like spikes and shit. It's got like a, it's got a, it's got a cage on the back. And the weirdest thing is, we get a lot of neighbours here. They all look at you when you're building that, but none of them ask like, what are you doing? Like, you know what I mean? Like they're just walking past going, oh yeah, they're just building some kind of horrific, you know, monster trap vehicle. That, that happens regularly in Roselle. Um, so there was that. So we built that. We wrote the treatment for the short film, which we figured would be the, the opening scene of the feature. So these two guys, they go into a, um, they go into like an empty field. They jump out of this uh, uh, monster zombie truck. They, um, uh, they armor up. They go out there, they catch a zombie and they drag it back in, they attach it to the vehicle and um, then they roar off and it's obvious that the, the zombie is somehow uh, fueling the vehicle because we've got this methane gas coming out of their mouth that's, that's pretty obvious. So we thought, you know, we'll do that and people will be amazed at this short film that we've done. They'll see the, the, the idea, the concept is original and new and of course we'll get funding. So we shot that, cost seven grand. We shot that in three days um, up in Newcastle. Um, we started writing serious treatments and, and getting heavily into the script, which at that stage was a, a serious post-apocalyptic type film. And um, you just, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of difficult to get the funding. Um, we had a lot of people bite, but um, I found, um, what, what, we, what we found occurred was um, people wanted to come in and change it, change the, the tone and they asked a lot of questions of we should have this, we should have that, why isn't there, a ch you know, there should be a love interest, there should be this and that. We were just like, you know what, like, you know, I think I was 30 at the time and I'd, I'd spent my entire life dreaming about being a film director, just dreaming. And like I fucking, I have a thousand stories in my head that I want to tell and the first film that I make has to come from me. And we started meeting with distributors and, and people like that and I found very quickly that if they, t if they fund you and if you join up with these guys, they're the fucking boss. Am I allowed to swear on this? They're, they're the boss. Now, now, I'd worked in the advertising industry for a while now, like sort of doing various things and I don't mind having a boss but not on this one, not on the first film. So we decided to take the plunge to kind of self-finance. Um, so we went down that road and um, we decided very quickly on the Indiegogo platform. Um, we were going to go Kickstarter, but you have to have an American bank account for Kickstarter. Like, that's retarded. But um, so we went with Indiegogo because you can have, you know, just an Australian bank account and you, and you just go for it. So we, we did the first push for funding, for production funding. We released the trailer online, um, just free of charge. Everybody said, don't do that. They're like, don't release your content. It's a bad idea. But by that time, we'd already rewritten the script like three or four times and we'd actually decided that that was not going to be the start of the film. So we had this seven minute short just sitting there that was not had anything to do with the film anyway. So let's do something with it. We'll make that the teaser trailer. We released that online. Um, meanwhile, we just started filming. So we just, we'd started shooting the thing and we're like, we're going to self-fund as we go. All of our money that we make in our day jobs goes straight into the film. We're just going to go scene by scene and we're going to work our way through the script. This was three years ago. Um, so we released the trailer online um, with an accompanying Indiegogo um, uh, video asking for, for funds. I think we were going for 20 grand at that point, which was like ridiculously low. There's no way you can make a film for 20 grand, but that's all right, you know, we just needed help. Um, the, the, the teaser trailer kind of blew up. So there was a point um, where we got like 100,000 hits in a week, which was very exciting. Because, I mean, that means there's an audience. Like, there's an audience waiting for this particular idea. And, you know, we kept getting comments like, what, no, why has nobody thought of this before? You know, Mad Max and Daughter of the Dead, such a great original concept, you know. Um, we were number one on reddit.com, like, number one video, I think, just for a day. 
and we didn't get a screen grab, I was like, what the fuck are we thinking? Uh, and that's huge. You know, that's like, that's like being on the front page of the internet, you know? So we were like, yeah, we're onto a winner here. Um, and um, that's pretty much how, how it went. And we've been doing that for three and a half years now. Every year we'd go and see Screen Australia and have a chat and they'd say, it's f fantastic, you guys, it's fantastic. Um, we'd say, well, can we have some money to, to do the thing? And they were like, well, no, um, for various reasons and good reasons, you know, because we didn't have a distributor, we'd, we're cowboys, we're out there just shooting a weird zombie film. So, you know, what are you going to do? But every year we'd come in and they'd go, fantastic, you know, you, you, um, and we're, um, you finished the film now, great, have you edited it? And we're like, no, we'll edit it, you know, and get back to us. And nine months later, we go back to Screen Australia and we go, oh, we finished the, finished the edit. And so we're in, we're, we're sort of in, we're in final talks now with Screen Australia. Screen Australia is finally kind of going, yeah, we're going to, they want to jump on board. They quite like the film now. Um, so we'll see how we go with that to be continued. I, yeah, I, I, I don't know what's going to happen with that. I'm fingers crossed. But yeah, we just spent three and a half years just smashing it, like shooting stuff literally in people's backyards. We shot, I think, about 15 to 20 percent of the action in a backyard in Kellyville that looks like, um, you know, the outback. Because um, one of the characters we really wanted to, to, to have in the film as a kind of character is the Australian landscape, you know. So we, we were really looking... At, you know, at the advantages that we had in the, you know, we've, you know, we've got the Mad Max thing, we've got this look that nobody's got in a zombie film that's ever been seen before. But I think Australia, as a, as a concept internationally, really sells. So the Australian landscape doesn't really look like any other landscape and people are obsessed with the bush and, and the outback. So we really wanted to have that in there as a character. So we shot uh, most of the outside action in the Blue Mountains, which is a beautiful location um, and we really took advantage of some some great stuff out there um, we shot some of it in this house so we had a whole extended sequence where uh, the the lead character has a home invasion by a zombie and he has to he has to wrestle the zombie right there where the camera is we shot ex uh, some night exteriors out in Granville and had the cops called that was pretty funny we we're shooting at like um, it was like 10 11 at night and we spent like eight hours setting up and on our first shot there's like a zombie having his innards eaten like on a, on a little road like back street in Granville and like so like 10 cop cars showed up like I'm not even kidding like just 10 they converged because the Granville police station is just around the, the corner and they had nothing else to do so they turned up and like this cop fool ran at me with his hand on his gun he's like what's going on and I'm like it was in the zombie film and he goes ah fuck call him off call him off and I'm like call like call who off like the helicopters and shit and he goes we thought there was a stabbing there was a report of a stabbing I'm like but we, we got cameras and lights and kind of stabbing would that be like a ritual stabbing like <laughs> what do you mean and he's just like ah fuck um but yeah that's that's low budget filmmaking in in Sydney um where am I what was the question again that's a long answer to a short question wasn't it <laughs> Anyway, we finished. We we finished shooting. Like it's been three and a half years, and it's been massive. Um, I, I, we've we've we're very close to a locked off edit. It came in at like two and a bit hours. We cut that down to eighty eight minutes, and we're sort of we're we're probably going to come in at around the ninety four ninety five minute area for running time. Um, and it's good. We're finally getting some interest and in stuff. You know, it's it's finally like it's. We've been sort of these, you know, weekend cowboys for so long. It's really, it's really kind of cool to be talking to people in the industry and like they're really positive, you know, and that's nice, you know, because, um, yeah, having worked for, for so long on our own on this project, it's really kind of cool to, to actually be about to release it to the world. So that's, it's been a big, it's been a big, it's the biggest thing I've ever done in my life, like making a feature film. I mean, this, this is going out to filmmakers and stuff. Like, I cannot tell you how difficult it is. I, I'm the kind of guy, I work pretty fast. Like, I can make a video clip in a day and edit it in half a day. I can make a short film in a weekend and edit it in a day. So I thought, like, I'd spend, like, maybe a year on this, like, maximum. Like, three and a half years later. Um, and it's epic. And it, it, it's... Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the one thing they don't tell you is, um, is just how, uh, how difficult it is to keep a crew together, especially when you're, they're all working on Deferred. So what you're dealing with, and my brother and I, the producer, often talk about this, is um, when you're not paying people, 
and you're working on a film, it's not like working on a crew with plumbers and it's not like working on a crew on a house. You're dealing with people's hopes and dreams and that's a really big thing that nobody tells you. So when people say like, um, uh, you know, tempers run high on a set and there's blow ups and people freak out and you know, they have screaming matches and all that. It, it's not just the long hours and the bad catering that do that and the hard work. Like you're actually di like you're in charge of people's hopes and dreams, you know, um, because it's a dream factory, and that's a that's a psychologically difficult position to be put in when you when you just want to try and make a film, you know, and you've got to deal with all these people's hopes and dreams. So that's 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 probably the the weirdest, hardest thing that I've had to do with. You have to play director and psychologist, and to do that for like three and a half years, that's tricky. That's a juggling act. I've been like obsessed with film since I was probably about seven or eight. You know, when you're a kid, you love going to the cinema and all that. But th there's a point, I think, where you, you realise that it's an obsession. Maybe eight, 10, 11, 12. Around that time, I just was like, that's what I want to do. Like just fucking obsessed. Um, we had a friend of the family who had one of those ridiculously large video collections. And he had just thousands of videos just all over his house, just shelves and shelves of the stuff. So we go to parties at his house and we'd be left in the, the TV room and we'd be left to our own devices. So when I was like 12 and 13, like I'd start watching films like Mad Max, Blade Runner, Apocalypse Now, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Star Wars. Those five films like set the benchmark and they're all the same in regards to they set up a world and I'm obsessed with films that do that. And you're there for two, two hours and it changes you. Like Star Wars changes you uh, when you see it for the first time. And that's what we really tried to do with Wormwood, you know, set up a world and anyway. Um, so I got obsessed with that when I was a kid. Um, and then when I was sort of, uh, you know, you go to high school, I fucking hated high school, like loathed with a passion. So I'd skip pretty much every day. I had a hundred consecutive, oh, well, not consecutive, but I had a hundred days off in a year by just not going and pretending to be sick or whatever. I had more days off than a kid in our class who had a brain tumour. And I'd stay home and I'd just watch movies. Like I'd go up to the video store, I'd rent six films, come back, watch them all, go back the next day, rent six more. Um, and they'd, I don't know what they thought at the video store. They're just like this weird autistic kid, just I don't know what he's doing. But, um, and that was, that was my film education. Uh, there was a point where I just left school in early year 11 because it wasn't happening. And I just watched films for just years and years, you know. Um, uh, or barely left my room at certain points, you know, um, and just did that for years and that, that was my education, you know, and I think um, I've read a lot of stuff with Quentin Tarantino, you know, I think he did the same thing, you know, his film school was, was the video store and so was mine, I just never worked there. Um, and that's a, it's a good education, I think, to have. Um, after that, I went to, um, I tried going to communications because I, I stupidly thought that was film school, but I got there and I realised it's journalism school. So I spent five weeks of communications and then just left. Um, bummed around for a bit and then I finally got to, um, to art school. I did a digital media degree up at Sydney College of the Arts. Now that was film school, but it wasn't very informative film school. They bas basically sort of left you alone. You had to be a self-starter there, which I am, which was really good. So I had three years doing a, a, a film degree that didn't really teach me much, but it allowed me access to the equipment and it allowed me to just make films like full time. So that was a good period. Did three years there, then did honours. Um, continued doing more arty stuff. Like I got obsessed for about a year with Michelle Gondry and video clips. And I thought that's what I want to do. So I did that for about a year and just obsessed on music videos until I realised that you can't make any money in this country on music videos. I love doing them, but I've gotten to the point where I'll just do a video for free. Don't even offer me the paltry budget that you've got. I'll do it for free and you can't tell me what to do. That's how I like to do music videos because otherwise what's, what's the point? You know, you're not going to make any money. Um, but I do love that format. So I did that for a while. As soon as I left, um, uh, soon as I left uh, uni, I... I found it very difficult to get a job in the industry, as you do, because there's not a lot of stuff going on in this country. It's, it's mental, actually, how small amount of jobs there are in this country, and you just end up working for free, which is pretty standard. Uh, and I went back to printing, film printing, um, which is what I'd done all through uni to, to make a buck. So um, that was, in a way, related. So you learn a lot about colour grading and um, uh, just photography in general through, through that. Um, Went, did that for I think about half a year and then finally got a job in a company called Aussie Bum, 
which is a fashion brand run by a very, very, very creative individual called Sean Ashby. Now he's, and I think you wouldn't mind me saying this, he's a crazy dude, he's insane, he's got so much energy. Um, it's kind of difficult to work with sometimes, but he's super creative and what he's very good at is making whole campaigns with very little money and very little to work with. Um, so this is a it's sort of a men's swimwear, underwear, fashion, uh, leisurewear company, but it's very, very based, you know, in the Australian uh, uh, thing. So he, we'd fly all over the country making campaigns for like swimwear, underwear, that kind of thing. And what it, what the way he works is you turn up to a location, which is fantastic, like Broome or, you know, um, Moreton Bay Island or these amazing places or um, sometimes overseas, but mostly in Australia. And you'd have a guy, you'd have a model, you'd have a product, you'd have no idea, you'd have limited props and you'd have 25 minutes. So he'd shoot, he does all the photography, so he'd do the, like he'd do the campaign, he'd shoot the campaign and then he'd go, okay, I want lunch, you've got 25 minutes to shoot a video. That's pretty hard and like that was my job, I was head of video for years, so, you know, I did that for six years and he's a really hard taskmaster and you'd, you'd sort of, uh, you'd shoot, the, you'd 25 minutes to shoot a campaign, you'd shoot eight campaigns sometimes in a day then you'd have to come back and you'd have to put together a campaign, you know, with like, fuck all. Um, and if, it, if, if, the, if the photography aspect didn't work, if the shooting didn't work, which it often didn't, you have to make something. So you have to go into After Effects and you make art and then you, you put it out there um, as advertising. Um, so to have that training for six years was invaluable for me to go into um, filmmaking because I was used to working with very little with no money and doing everything myself. So shooting, editing, sound design, sound, uh, and all of the motion graphics. So if you can do all of that, man, like you're a one man band, you know, you're like that guy, you know, you see on the corner where he's got like a cymbal and a guitar and he's like a mouth organ and he's playing the drums with his foot. That's what you gotta be. You gotta be that guy, you know, as a filmmaker, you have to be able to do everything because Half the time, we were talking about this before, you, you'll set something up and you go, okay, we're shooting this, we need this crew, nobody turns up. You're lucky if you get a sound man. So you've got to shoot, you've got to light, you've got to know how to do all of that shit because especially in this country, there's no budgets. So I'm one of those people who, if somebody says you can't do it, I'm going to fucking do it. And like, I will not ever have anybody shut down one of my productions for the simple reason that nobody turns up. If nobody turns up, I'll go to the actor's house, I'll pull them out of bed, and I will make the goddamn scene myself. And that's, that's powerful. And that's something that you have, to, you have to be able to do in this industry. You have to, be, like you can't rely on anybody else. If the sound guy doesn't turn up, you have to be able to do the sound, you know? If the camera doesn't turn up, you have to have bought a camera and you have to be able to use it yourself. That way nobody can ever shut you down. Um, and that's, um, that's, that's really the central philosophy of, of, of how I make movies. Um, because, you know, if we took, which we kind of did, you, know, you take the idea for Wormwood around to distributors, you know, you'll be waiting a few years, you know, or it won't happen. And, um, like, I, I just refuse to not be able to do what I want to do just because of some stupid little thing like budget, you know. You can make a sock puppet version of your film, you know. Nobody should ever stop you from, from doing what you want to do. And that's, that's a very important lesson, I think. And that, that re I really learned a lot of that during my first my first job because it was um, it was all about um, self-starting in that in that job which is great so that's that's pretty much what led me here um, I literally quit that job three weeks ago um, my boss thought I was insane he's a multi-millionaire so he's very good at business um, and he's just like no no now is not the time what are you doing and I just, it's like no it, now is the time I had to take a big risk I've got no I've got no safety net I've got a bit of savings which is mostly going into the film but um, I've quit now because we're about to release to a festival and I, I can't work even part time while I'm trying to usher this baby through. So, um, and there, I, I think there is a point in most filmmakers' careers where you've got to take that risk. And I, you know, I, I read a lot of biographies like, like we all do, you know, and you, your heroes, you, the David Lynch's and the, particularly the Peter Jackson's. And I read, you know, I was reading just that chapter where he had to quit his job. He was a, an engraver. He engraved shit on stuff. I, I don't know what he did, but he just quit. He didn't have a safety net. He was still living with his parents. And um, he just goes, no, now's the time to be a full-time filmmaker. And he went off and he made uh, Meet the Feebles. And then he made Brain Dead. And he made Heavenly Creatures. And then he made $100 million. 
So, you know, he took the risk and, and it paid off for him, you know, but you've got to have the confidence to be stupid. And, and I guess that's what I did a couple of weeks ago when I quit full time to, to, to follow your dreams at the end of the day. That's what it is. You know, you've got to do it. And if you've got the confidence, you've got to, you've got to do it. You can't just talk about it.